Hello, and thanks for joining us today. I'm Helen Soslowski. I'm the Events Director for Oblong Books in New York's Hudson Valley. We're delighted this evening to welcome authors Christine Sneed and Joya Diliberto, who will read from their new novels, Please Be Advised, a novel in memos, and Coco at the Ritz. And then they're going to talk about them with author Scott Spencer. A reminder that if you have any questions for our authors, author Scott, please type them in the chat or in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen and we'll address them at the end of the program. To tell you a little bit about our guests this evening, Christine Sneed is the author of the novels Paris, He Said, and Little Known Facts, and the story collection Portraits of a Few of the People I've Made Cry and The Virginity of Famous Men. She's also the editor of the short fiction collection Love in the Time of Times Up, which came out just last month. And her work has appeared in the Best American Short Stories, O. Henry Prize Stories, The New York Times, O Magazine, The New England Review, The Southern Review, Plowshares, and many other periodicals. She has received the Grace Paley Prize in Short Fiction, the Society of Midland Authors Award, the Chicago Public Library's 21st Century Award, among other honors. And Christine teaches for the MFA programs at Northwestern University and Regis University. Joya Diliberto has written biographies of Jane Addams, Hadley Hemingway, Diane von Furstenberg, and Brenda Fraser, as well as the critically acclaimed novels, I Am Madam X and The Collection. Her journalism has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, the Chicago Tribune, Smithsonian, and Vanity Fair. She also teaches writing and has taught at Northwestern and DePaul Universities and the Savannah College of Art and Design. Leading the conversation this evening, author Scott Spencer is the author of 12 novels, including An Ocean Without a Shore, Endless Love, Walking the Dead, A Ship Made of Paper and Willing. He's taught at Columbia University, the Iowa Writers Workshop, Williams College, the University of Virginia, and at Eastern Correctional Facility as part of the Bard Prison Initiative. Both of our featured books, as well as Love in the Time of Time's Up, the new collection of short fiction edited by Christine, plus a great selection of Scott's books, are available at both our stores and online through oblongbooks.com. So thank you and welcome for joining us. I'm gonna hand you all over to Scott. Hello, everybody. Um, I've actually been looking forward to this all day and I'm so happy to have a chance to hang out with uh, two writers who have just uh, put out really special and extraordinary uh, uh, pieces of work. You know, you can tell the, the health of a culture by, by the books that are, that are published. And sometimes I feel, oh my God, what's happening to us? We're just circling the drain as a culture. But then I read, uh, I, I, I pull myself back from the abyss and I pick up a book like, like Coco uh, and, and, and Christine's book. And I'm just filled with enthusiasm and, and, and hope again. So I, I was going to say some of the things about, about Joya and Christine that have already been said about all the, the things that they've done. I think it's really interesting when I think about Joya's work, how she sort of alternates between fiction and nonfiction, and sometimes mining this, the, the same territory, the same general milieu of, of elegance and, and, and luxury and, and the past. Um, like Christine and myself, Joy is, is, has Chicago roots, but now she lives uh, pretty near us in, in Connecticut. And I'm really eager to hear her not only read from her novel, but to discuss some of the rather thorny issues that her novel addresses, both inside the text and outside of the text. Christine is now sitting in her home in California, but I still think of her as a Chicago writer, and I, I think she, she does too. Uh, these, there's, there's some overlap, I think, in, in both of these writers' imaginations. Well-heeled Paris has been 
really vividly portrayed in Christine's novel, Paris, he said, and it's very vividly portrayed in Coco at the Ritz. And in little known facts, Christine also interrogates what wealth and celebrity and how it distorts and our perceptions of people and, and our people's perceptions of themselves. And these are concerns that run nearly to every page in, in Joya's work. When I, when I think about the two works we're about to hear tonight, what I, when I think of them side by side, I see that they're very different. Coco the Ritz brings the contemporary sensibility to a kind of narrative that seems deceptively close to what, you know, to, to the classic approach to the novel. It's, it's what in old Hollywood was, was called like a, a costume drama with the bygone era, bygone glamour and the art world and celebrities transporting us back to a world of, what is it now, like 75 years ago. But the novel in fact is nothing, if not unsettling. It's, it's not like a, a, a cozy read because it brings up moral questions that are firmly rooted in the time in which it takes place, but really resonates so powerfully in our own time. And on Christine's novel, which by the way is completely hilarious, the novel's traditions are almost completely ignored and we're plunged into the purgatorio of the inner office memo. Can there be anything more soul destroying than the inner office memo? And what brilliance and what bravery to take this thing, this, this, this drainer of souls and actually fashion it into not only a novel, but a novel that is completely enjoyable. You know, he, he, it's, it reminds me, I mean, very few people write about work. We have like David Foster Wallace's uh, The Pale King. We have our friend and neighbor, Josh Ferris's wonderful book. And then we came to the end. And then, you know, of course, then you, you, you have to go to television with things like, like, like The Office. But please be advised, it's a treat. And like Joya's novel, it offers us a way out of the dreary dailiness of life. And so that's my little piece for now. And we forgot to flip a coin to see who goes first, but because on this little screen, you're sitting next to me, Joy, I'm gonna ask you to read from Coco at the Ritz. On my screen, I'm not sitting next to you. I'm way <laughs> there by myself but I'm happy to do that. And thank you so much, Scott. And I think Christine would agree with me that we both feel the culture, some hope for the culture because of you um, and your writing. And of course I feel that way about, about Christine's and I totally agree that her novel, Please Be Advised is completely laugh out loud hysterical and everybody should, should read it. It's a, it's, if, you, if you want to laugh and who doesn't want to laugh, um, but this, this is not going to make you laugh. <laughs> this is um, the opening of my novel, which is um, the moment that Coco Chanel is arrested by the French forces of the interior. This is August 1944. When the doorbell rang at 8.30 on that hot, languid morning, Coco knew they'd come to arrest her. She might have wondered for a moment if someone else was at the door, perhaps the laundress with fresh linen or a porter with a glove she dropped in the lobby. But she knew. Though the carpet muffled their footsteps, she sensed them striding down the hall at the Ritz, Coco and her animal cunning. She knew from the fierce jangle of the bell from the way the maid's heels clicked so frantically across the floor and the door roared open, she knew. She crushed her cigarette in an ashtray. Her body trembled, surprising her. Lighting another cigarette, she took a moment to pull herself together. The room was warm with the white morning sun slanting through the windows 
and the air had a stale floral scent. The mixed fragrances of number five perfume, tobacco and pink roses, which were displayed in tables, on the tables in crystal vases. Until that moment, she hadn't thought she'd be arrested. Now she began to worry as she peeked out the bedroom door and saw the soldiers, the two young men from the French forces of the interior, standing in her suite with their grim expressions and guns tucked into their belts. Spots had already left Paris with the retreating Germans and Coco was alone as she'd so often been in life with her fame and her money and her secrets, which kept anyone from getting too close. Of course, the men have come for her because of spots. And that wasn't fair because her German lover wasn't really a Nazi. He wasn't a cold blooded killer. His mother was English after all, and he lived in Paris for a third of his life. Why should she feel guilty about spots? Anyway, she wasn't going to hide in the closet or jump out the window. She wasn't a coward. There was a soft knock on the bedroom door. Coco opened it a crack and saw the maid. Mademoiselle, what should I do? The maid whispered. Ask them to give me a minute to dress, Coco said. If they take me and I'm not back in two hours, tell the manager at the boutique to call Winston Churchill. The prime minister? Yes. His private number is in the book in my desk. Coco pulled the door shut and flipped through the hangers in her closet, deciding on her number two suit and navy blue jersey, a more casual version of the number one model she'd worn in her working days. From the jewelry box on her dressing table, she took three strands of pearls and a jeweled enameled cuff. She looped the pearls around her neck and secured the cuff on her wrist. Then she reconsidered the jewelry. No need to call attention to her prosperity. So she stuffed the pearls and bracelet in a drawer. Coco was 61, though she was younger thanks to expertly dyed dark brown hair and good bone structure. Now, arranging her face in a determined expression, she smoothed her skirt and opened the bedroom door. Two ordinary youths dressed in brown slacks and plain white shirts stood in the foyer. She eyed the shiny pistols jammed into their belts. Their shirts flashed armbands emblazoned with FFI and the cross of the Lorraine, the symbol of the French forces of the interior, the loose band, of resistance fighters, soldiers, and private citizens who taken up arms in the aftermath of the Germans' departure. Gabrielle Chanel, come with us, said the taller youth. He had a spray of adolescent pimples on his cheeks, but his fine brown hair was already thinning. By whose order, she asked, louder than she intended. The people of France and the victims of fascism, said the second youth. He was short and stocky and looked even younger than his partner with smooth pink cheeks and curly chestnut hair. The maid was sobbing now, her face buried in her hands. Do you have any identification? Coco demanded. They would never see her cry. You must come with us, said the taller youth. Who gave you your orders? If you don't come voluntarily, we'll take you by force. Coco clasped her hands to stop them from trembling. On what charge? The taller boy spoke in a harsh, unflinching voice. Treason. So good. That was wonderful. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I wish we could start uh, our conversation, start my video. Yeah. <laughs> the host has asked me to start my video. I will. Oh, that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, so, Christine, do you feel like reading to us? I I will. Yes, and I want to flash Joya's beautiful book 
and it also gorgeous. Some of Scott's, which I own several, and I'm I'm in the throes of packing, so I don't have all of them, but I just I okay. just <laughs> <don't> <laughs> to like <laughs> yeah. wave some of Scott's. <laughs> really, I mean Scott, I actually read. I think the first book I read by you was a ship made of paper back in the early 2000s. And then I read Endless Love finally a number of years later and Willing also, and then just sort of sucked them all <laughs> up very quickly. And I, I mean, I know other, I, I've talked to other writers about your work. I remember talking to Jane Hamilton a number of years ago and I said, oh, I read Endless Love not long ago. She's like, when I read that book, it seared me. And she had this intense look on her face. And I just thought, yeah, this is, you know, this is the excitement of being a reader. And just that's be why I became a writer. And I suppose all of us here, that was why we became writers because we had such strong and powerful responses to other writers' books. And we wanted to be part of that. Well, thank you. But anyway, enough of me <laughs> embarrassing our, our interlocutor slash celebrity um, host. So I, I will read um, a little from Please Be Advised. And uh, I wrote this book, a lot of it in 2017 and 2018. And I had just written a long sort of straightforward novel. That was a comedic book that I haven't yet published. And I didn't want to stop writing in that voice, that sort of off kilter voice that I hoped would be comedic. And um, so these memos were, I wrote a few, I thought, well, maybe they'll just be flash pieces. And then I just kept writing because I wanted to keep thinking and working in the world of, of these characters. So um, I will, I'm gonna read a story of personal triumph too, which is a, uh, I'll say more about it in a second. And I think I just lost my page. So I have to, to find where I got so excited showing everyone's books. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so here we go. Inner office memorandum, date September 21st, to all Quest Industries employees from mid-level management. Subject, workplace, et cetera, et cetera, part three. Over the last several months, we have noticed what appear to be symptoms of raging loneliness in Quest Industries employees. We are not sure why this problem persists, as over the last few years, we have paid considerable sums to consulting firms specializing in team building exercises designed to make ours a more cordial, supportive, and inclusive workplace. But these two-bit charlatans, however, have let us down. In order to remedy the atmosphere of loneliness and ennui pervading our workplace, we would like to suggest adding these simple activities to your workday. One, complement each other frequently and as is possible with sincerity. Here are some sample compliments you might utilize at Quest Industries as the occasion merits. A, your workplace casual wardrobe choices today are very appealing. B, your teeth are so white. Would you mind sharing with me the name and phone number of your dentist? C, would you like to carpool with me? I just acquired a very fuel efficient car and would love to pick you up in the morning and take you home at night. D, do you like checkers? Yes? Great, let's play after work today. Or, no, what about Scrabble? I've heard that most highly intelligent people like you love Scrabble. E, I've decided to start an office volleyball team. Are you good at serving or are you better at spiking? F, I'm so happy to be your colleague. You're very bright and make me feel good about my life choices every time I see you. Two, adopt an animal. Below is a list of the species we suggest you consider, arranged in order of starter pet to very advanced. A, goldfish. B, hamster or mouse. C, guinea pig. D, tarantula. E, finch, parakeet or budgie. F, boa constrictor. G, kitten. H, puppy. I, pot-bellied pig. J, capuchin monkey. K, alligator. L, horse. M. Komodo dragon. We are aware that loneliness is a pervasive and systemic problem, a byproduct of our increasingly prevalent and infuriating habit of unapologetic navel gazing. Be that as it may, we want you to know you are in capable hands here. Coming soon, employee wellness survey. We are very excited to learn more about your obsessions, hobbies, fears, and addictions. And I'm going to read a 
story of personal triumph, which a lot of probably the people who are here out of sight um, are, are ghostly participants or, or our attendees have heard about corporate storytelling programs where a company will hire someone to come in and teach people to tell stories about themselves or write stories. I don't know if they're meant to be fiction or nonfiction, but I thought, you know, that's one way for me to get characters, individuals, vo their individual voices into the book. So I also took um, Dave, um, Larry David's MO. He said that his character on Curb Your Enthusiasm gets to say all the things he wishes he could say in real life. And I thought, well, what would it be like if in the workplace we could actually do that and not get fired? So that's kind of the, the foundation of the book is just saying all the inappropriate things that many of us might think, but be too afraid to say for fear of being fired or becoming an outcast. Inner office memorandum, date June 2nd, to all Quest Industries employees from Fred Sabin, chief financial officer, subject, my story of personal triumph. I suppose no one here is dying for another one of these nutso yarns, but in the spirit of collegiality, I'm adding my story of personal triumph to the official record. My hope is you will remember it and me fondly. Honest Abe by Fred Sabin. One day in my semi-halcyon youth, I received an invitation to, a to attend a Halloween party. As a rule, I detest Halloween parties and always have, but my then wife, Taffy, insisted we go because unbeknownst to me at the time, she had a raging crush on the host and was in the midst of a years long affair with this fool. We divorced two years later after I, after I discovered not only was she stooping him senseless several afternoons a week, they were also selling her Valium and expired birth control pills to teenage girls and boys behind the Dairy Queen on Friday nights. Back to the matter at hand. Because I am tall, gaunt, and dark bearded like our 16th president, I, I decided to go as Honest Abe to the Halloween party. I had a stovepipe hat left over from my brief flirtation with magician school and a dusty, ill-fitting black suit. I also acquired a prosthetic nose and pasted one of those warty looking things to my cheek. My resemblance to Mr. Lincoln was so striking, one woman at the party passed out, thinking I was the real President Lincoln back from the dead. Another woman, very fetching and quite buxom in her witch costume, tried to kiss me. And I also won best costume that night. It truly was a triumph, objectively speaking, as I was still ignorant of my wife's infidelity and drug dealing. She eventually learned her extracurricular paramour was sleeping with at least two other women. One of them was a Wiccan whose mother made very good pickle relish. I knew this mother-daughter pair very slightly. The other was a golf pro who traveled the world, was rumored to have slept with Jack Nicholas, and whipped him with a jump rope after he won the Masters down in Augusta. Thank you for reading my story of personal triumph, such as it is. I think I'll stop there. I, I know, I think we're gonna read a little bit later, so I'll save an, one or two more memos. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was really, really funny. Um, Joya. It's different than Joya's work. <laughs> Couldn't be less similar. <laughs> you couldn't, couldn't be writing about things that are less glamorous, and you <laughs> could not be writing about things that were more glamorous. So, Joya, first, the question that, that, that occurs to me, that, you know, as I'm listening to that really wonderful opening to your to your novel, it's it's such a perfect setup, and there's no. I don't know, there's just no time to even get seated and you're just whooshed right in, into the action, which I just, I just uh, love that. But when, when, um, when, when Chanel tells her maid to call Winston Churchill and look in my book, I've got his, uh, I've got his private number um, what, when you imagine someone reading that, do you imagine what they're feeling at that moment? Are you trying to, are you trying to like control 
or to shape in some way what the reader's reaction to that is? Because it's, very, it's a very loaded moment. No, not at all. I, uh, I was just thinking about Coco, the character. And this is actually my second novel about Coco Chanel. Yes, I know. You, know, the, uh, you see her through the eyes of, of, of a more humble person. Over right, the right. So I had her, I had her voice. I, 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 I knew her and I was just reacting to what I knew about her. I mean, and my rule in writing historical fiction is to not contradict the known truth. Christine has heard me say that many times. <clears throat> so I only invent in the interstitials where things could have happened or did happen. And in this case, so little was known about her arrest and interrogation, and indeed about how she spent the war and her behavior during the war that I had an enormous latitude. Um, and so, but I also had this character and this voice that was based on the real Chanel um, and based on my reading about Chanel and what I knew about her, but it's still my literary construct. It's not, it's not the real Chanel, it's my Chanel, but I hope uh, I've, just, I've been able to convey some truth about her. Um, and she was in fact in life friends with Winston Churchill. So uh, she would have had his number probably. And he would have had her number too, but. Well, but, but a moment like that really shapes our relationship to the character. And, you know, that, that's, I think that, you know, the bravery of that, of that kind of writing, because, you know, now more than ever, you know, we're sort of tiptoeing around each other and, and you know, trying not to get canceled and trying not to trigger anybody and, and uh, you know, Chanel is herself, you know, such a, uh, a a troubling figure, really, because you know she obviously created beauty in the world, yet she was, you know, perhaps and probably yes, was you know, you know, guilty of of, of degrees of collaboration, as were many other very prominent. I mean, like Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Toklas, you, you know, found a way to keep their creature comforts going dur during uh, the, the, the Nazi period. And, you know, after the war, after the defeat of Nazism, of course, two thirds of the French people were in the resistance. But in fact, that nothing remotely like that was true. Everyone found a way to keep life as familiar as possible. Yet for us, that's, you know, it's troubling and, and, and you take on the you know, fact that I mean the reality that that, that there there'll, there'll be readers who will be pushing against you if, if when yes. you want to do that. Well, and one of the things I wanted to explore was the moral ambiguity of war, and how most people were like Andre Gide said, not heroes of the resistance or villains of collaboration, but somewhere in between. They were like old shoes floating through murky waters, and. Uh, nobody in my story comes out smelling like smell number five. You know, they're all, they're all morally compromised. And that was for me, something that was very interesting to explore. But I know for a lot of readers, they want moral clarity. They want a, they want a heroine they can root for. And um, Chanel is not that person. No, no, no. So, so walk me through walk me through this and, because you work both sides of the street. You've written nonfiction, you've written fiction. I mean, I I, I assume you you make the choice for a reason. Not, you know, not just, I mean, of course, half what we do is mood based, but so you might just be in the mood to write a novel. But I think this it probably goes uh, deeper in that. So, so walk me through the differences that you've encountered in preparing to write a biography and preparing to write a novel. What, what's the difference in how I prepare and how yes. I do the work? Yes. Well, I, for both of them, I do an incredible amount of research. And 
in this case, I would have written it as a nonfiction book had there been enough material available, but the record was so scant. I, I was, when I discovered that she had been arrested for collaboration and that these guys had come to the Ritz and hauled her out and stuffed her into a Jeep and took her somewhere and interrogated her and then let her go. Um, I just thought that was such a fascinating moment and what was a fascinating life. And there, I wanted to explore it and the only way to do it was imaginatively. And so uh, I read all the books about Chanel and I read all the books about the occupation, but I had to invent the entire interrogation because unlike in a real court case, there were no records and she didn't talk about it and she paid people to keep her out of their memoirs. So that was complete invention, though based on what I think could have happened. Um, so, and I had her voice, as I said before, in my, in my head, thank God it's not in my head anymore. And I could, you know, I just felt like I could write Chanel dialogue until the cows came home. I just but, had her. Why do, why do you say thank God it's not in your head anymore? I don't, I, she's, she's not somebody I want to feel close to and not someone whose voice I want ringing in my head. Um, and so I, I'm glad it's, it's not in there anymore, but, but I had that. And, and I think because I had that voice, I felt that I could, I could, um, I could do it. And I and I hope I wanted to say something about humor. I hope there's a, a little bit of humor in the book, even though it's a, a very dark subject. Because I feel like that's one of the elements of a great novel is humor. And 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 Christine, this is a comic novel. Please be advised. But um, all of Christine's novels have humor in them. And Scott, all of yours do too. The ones I haven't read all of them, but I've read a good deal of them and I've recently reread several. Um, and they have, there's, a, there's a lot of humor there. And I think that's a really <clears throat> important element. And Coco was kind of humorous on occasion, I think. Um, but. Yeah, well, uh, thank you. So Christine. Um, your novel is basically, a, you know, a humorous novel, but unlike many humorous novels, yours is actually funny, and you can actually laugh. You know, you know, as as a friend or as a guest at a dinner party, I, I am actually known to be quite funny, and I, I say this with all due modesty. But I think I, I I may be funny as a kind of like a self medicating strategy against against social nervousness but writing something funny in other words being funny when I'm sitting all by myself that doesn't at all come naturally to to me so so tell me tell me about sitting alone in a room and writing humor how, how does how does that work how, how can you tell if something's funny or not well, I mean, I think you are also are an only child. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I think I just got good at amusing myself when I was little. And so when I'm writing, if I'm amused, I know not everyone has the same sense of humor that I do, but I think if I'm laughing, I may not laugh tomorrow if I read the same line, but if I do laugh tomorrow, then I think, okay, well, maybe there's something here that will make other people laugh or like a year from when I wrote it. So mm -hmm if I have a little distance or a fair amount, a lot of distance, you know, I'm, I think that, you know, that's the litmus test, but also just, I think mostly I write to, if I'm writing in a humorous vein, it has to evolve organically. I, I mean, I might have a character or a type, I often start with a title or, I, or I'll have the idea of a character. So if I feel like the title, if there's some way I can approach it that is, the lens is just slightly off or I want it to be a little bit quirky. It has to start at the beginning. There might be a little bit of humor that comes into a more serious story, but if it's going to just be straight up comedic, it, I think it has to be there right from the beginning. And I, and I sense that, or I can tell from the voice, you know, right, the voice that I am trying to get on the page. And, but distance definitely helps, you know, after, if you've written something, I don't want to send it out the moment I write the last words because 
I've looked at some things that I wrote after taking a late night comedy writing class out here in LA with UCLA. And I looked at a script I wrote two years ago. It was so bad. <laughs> I was like, this is not funny. And I showed it to the class. And so I was, yeah. So I, it's, it's, I think I really do need distance, even if it's, in most cases, it doesn't have to be a full two years, but having written most of this book in 2017 and 2018, and then getting it accepted when I began sending it out in 2021, I had so much time from when I wrote the first draft. So I was able to, I think, look pretty, I was, I was very harsh. Like if I didn't think something was funny, I, I was very unsentimental about taking it out or making it better. Kill all your little punchlines, as Faulkner said. <laughs> um, but you said you, you start off with a voice. And, and Joya talks about having Coco Chanel's voice in her head. But in, in, in Please Be Advised, there isn't a voice. It's a, it's a cacophony of, of, of voices that you, that you have in your head. You know, in writing a novel, my experience has been that, that we, we attach most closely to one or maybe two of the characters, you, you know, usually the main characters. So I'm, I'm wondering how you dealt with writing a novel in which the main character, I don't know, is the novel itself is the main character. I mean, or the office is, is the main character or the idea of the office of, of the main character, the idea of, of being trapped with people who you wouldn't normally even know is 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 the uh, so um, talk about that. And I have a couple more questions about that. And I bet you enjoy it us too. We can all talk. I don't. It doesn't have to be just me, you, and then you, me. But we can all get in here together. I you know I think of Ken Crickshaw, who's the office manager, who's was a coroner, but he left that job in disgrace to become the office manager at Quest Industries mm -hmm. as one of the two main voices in the book. And then Brian Stokerly Esquire, who's the president of Quest, and he's this failed actor who is also completely incompetent as a corporate president or as a president of a collapsible office products uh, at, at, the, at the company that is the focus of the book. So those two voices I see them as foils. So that helped me as I was writing mm -hmm. because I really, I love Ken, Brian. I, I like him because I created him, but also he's just, he's just like sort of emblematic of what I think is one of the worst qualities of corporate America is like the boss is the cult of the boss, even if they're completely incompetent. So I, I, I wanted him to be an avatar for that. And I, I want to just wanted to say, Christine, that um, one thing I really admired uh, about this book, and one thing I think that is so hard to do in a novel like this, is you've created a world that could never exist, and yet the emotion that you feel as a reader reading it is very real. And you've captured something, you, you feel for these people, you can feel their yearning and you can, you can feel the damage to them from being in these soul crushing jobs, even though it's a completely crazy world that, uh, that would never, never really exist. And it, 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 it made me think of, um, you know, even Gogol, you know, and, and the nose and you know how a story that's that's just so not based in reality that's not you know whereas my book about Coco is certainly based and really really grounded in reality and how it can how it still can have some genuine truth in it and, and emotion and even while you're laughing out loud. Um, well thank you I I really um, just, I realized it was going to be sort of off the rails right from the beginning. Uh, just, but I, I mean, I think I used to teach business writing and at, at Loyola and DePaul in Chicago. And I always thought, you know, when we, we would do mock interviews, so students would write a resume and a cover letter as one of their assignments. And then we would do mock interviews in front of the class with 
three students interviewing another student and then me observing and giving feedback. And I, and the question that I think we've all encountered if we've ever applied for a job and been interviewed is, what is your weakness? And, I, and I'm like, who would ever say what their real weakness is? And so the, just the dishonesty of the corporate environment that I just find anyone who's smart is just gonna be like, this is friggin' ridiculous. Like, why do I have to pretend to be something I'm not? So I, I, that's really at the foundation of this book, despite all the jokes and everything, I thought the absolute, like the condescension, the madness, it's just maddening to have to pretend that you like everyone you work with. I mean, obviously you have to try to get along with people in the world so it doesn't just completely fall apart. But I, I just, it's hard. Like I just knew pretty early on in my life that I didn't want to work in an office forever. It just, I found it just difficult. And, and then that's, you know, I wanted to capture the fact that a lot of us do it just because we have families to support and we have no other options really that we feel comfortable pursuing while we have to pay bills. So I, I, I was thinking about all that as I was working on these memos. But have you, either of you ever worked in, in an office like, like this? I mean, I mean, not, not like this, but that, that was structured like this where you had, have, your, you have. Yeah, it's based on a job I had for two years right after I got out of undergrad in Chicago. It's actually set in the same building on the same floor where the office was. And I liked the people I worked with, but the job itself was stultifying. And I was also getting paid $22,000 a year. This was in the 90s, but, but that, I mean. Not enough money even in the 90s. It was like nothing. I mean, I, I don't know how I survived and I did, but I knew like everyone else who was in, and they're all men for the most part who were in offices and the rest of us were in cubicles. The men were getting these big bonuses. And I think I got like $15 for my Christmas bonus for the first year. I remember getting the check and just being like, this is it. And I, it was just, I just was so disappointed and angry and hurt and it, and of course it wasn't personal it was just the machine and i i found it just utterly contemptible and that was one of the things as a writer i'm like i'm so glad that i have the ability now after years and years of being a writer to write about these things in a way that i can try to understand my response but also like try to understand america and how we've become the nation we've become frighteningly you know in the last decade or two. It's, it's been horrifying to see what's going on, especially with the separation of wealth, most of it at the top sucked up by a huge magnet. So I, you know, that's part of this too. Exactly. So, I mean, did you know where you were going with this book? Did you have like an outline? Did you know where you were going to land? I wanna ask you the same question I, I can more imagine my way into the process that you used writing your book because it's it's more of a traditional narrative that that I've done way too many times. But no, you, I think we, we're ready for some more. <laughs> but were you just winging it here? Were you just sort of keeping yourself amused? Or did, you know, did you have a game plan? Did you know that by page 150 that there would, that it would turn in this direction? And then, and then you knew when you were coming to the final shore that you were getting close. I mean, tell me all about that. Are you, are you asking me, Scott? I'm asking Christine first, but then I'm gonna go back to you with that because you I can understand how you did it a little more. I think I do. Yeah, Joya has a linear narrative. I mean, obviously the interiority, you had to create that entirely wholesale. But uh, as far as my plan, you know, I wrote a draft. It was more or less complete when I submitted it to Kurt Baumeister, my editor at 713 Books. And then we talked a bit, had, a, had one maybe hour long conversation. And he suggested, you know, I think we need a couple more unifying plot threads. So I came, I came up with some ideas about Ken Crickshaw's character because he's, his son is missing. So we find out by the end what happened. And then also the IRS audit, I added that. Mm -hmm. So, and then Quest of course 
goes through a transformation and it becomes a different kind of company by the end. So I, I was really, those were the signposts. I think everything else, I was just thinking of it as a pastiche. Mm -hmm. And and that for me, and I was a poetry MFA. So I think I felt comfortable writing these short pieces that were very compressed. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the voice of each of the characters, especially in the stories of personal triumph, it was, it was just so much fun. So, and I, and I love short stories. They're my favorite fictional form. So I, I just, even though these are mostly flash memos, um, I just enjoyed creating a new story basically with every memo, even if it was a continuation of a previous subject. But, but for you, Joy, did you, did you know pretty much where this novel was going to take you before you began? Well, I first wrote it as a play. Wow, that's, <laughs> I think that's so interesting because I, you know plays really are are the roots of the novel. I mean, before we had the novel, we had plays, and that the, that I consider our our origin story. Hmm. Well, I had never written a play before, and it was really difficult. Uh, one of the great pleasures of it was reading a lot of plays that I'd seen on stage, um, but reading them was trans forming for me. Um, but the play is so hard to write. I found a play really, really hard to write, but I envisioned this first as an interrogation. As, um, and that's why I wrote it as a play, as um, an argument, basically. Right. You know, was she a collaborator? Was she guilty? And what is a collaborator? What does it mean to be a collaborator? And so, um, and and from and it had several staged readings, two at the actor studio. It was part of the um, festival of plays, and I didn't know anything about a play. I didn't even know the terms. They, the actor would actors would come to me. There were these great New York actors, and they would say, "Well, what about?" And I would like have no idea what they were talking about. How exciting! So I didn't know. You know, what do you mean tech? What do you mean we can have tech? I have no idea what that meant. Um, but it was a, an exciting experience, but then it didn't get a production. And I, I was unsatisfied with this. With, I wanted to explore more. I wanted, because I am a prose writer. And so I thought, oh, well, got a voice in my head. I'll write a novel. I'm not thinking that it would be as hard as it ended up being. Well, how long did that take you? Well, it took me, it took me a long time because I, I, I wrote it, part of it, and then I, took a job as ghost writing a book and uh, put it aside. And then I started a nonfiction book and then I went back to it. So it took, a, it took quite, a, a, quite a while to actually write it. Um, so did you have an outline? Do you have, do you have little, little post-its over your desk? You have... I do sort of have a lot of post-its um, always over my desk, but it, as Christine was saying, it's a linear, it's a pretty linear story. So uh, the structure was informed by the events as they unfolded. And um, I knew that I was gonna end it with the interrogation and with, with her. When I first moved to New York, I don't know, Catherine Hepburn oh. played C Coco Chanel on Broadway. And I, I, in my enthusiasm for being in New York, I, I got tickets to that. I don't even know how I did that. But, you know, this is sort of pathetic, but I don't remember a thing about it, except that Catherine Hepburn played Coco. And I remember the 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 one sheet, the drawing, it's like a Hirschfield drawing was the, uh, on, on the playbill. But do you know, did they, did they, uh, deal with with with, with no. the, the reality it was just a, it was just a gloss over it was a gloss and it was supposed to be really bad um despite Catherine Hepburn and yeah it was just a just a gloss and even in the biographies of Chanel the arrest her arrest and interrogation has is just like a little paragraph two sentences and to me she's a stand-in for the treachery of France I think and I think there's another line in the novel where she says, I am France. So I, I see her as kind of an anti-Marianne, the symbol of French quality and liberty and fraternity. And the whole country was really guilty. She, she's part of that, but she, she's a symbol of that too. And 
that to me made it attractive as a subject because I thought it would have some cultural. Well, some there's, those, there's those great documentaries about that period, you know, the Hotel Terminus and Sorrow and the Pity, and uh, it's uh, well, you know, I think it's obvious that I'm not that involved with fashion. Um, <laughs> but I, uh, yeah, I reacted, the first thing I reacted to in, your, in, in, in this, the title of your book is I was married to someone named Coco and I had two children with her. But, you know, one of the great achievements of your book is, is, is that you make that world so real and understandable and engaging even for a, a fashion illiterate. But I'm curious, you know, what your personal relationship is with that rarefied world and what drew you to Coco Chanel, not once, twice. Well, I love fashion, but my, my initial reaction, my initial interest was aesthetic. I was interested in how she revolutionized dress for women. You know, before Chanel, women wore these floor grazing skirts and corsets and very fancy, things with lots of furbelows and these big hats that looked like catering trays. And she pared everything down and made things simple and clean and elegant. And it's a style that really is how most women still want to dress. But also what she was doing was fit in, and this is like right after World War I, and it fit in with what was going on in the arts at the time. Um, what, what Hemingway was doing in writing, what, Picasso was doing in painting and Stravinsky was doing in music and what Jean Cocteau was doing in film and on the stage, this overturning the old order and this paring down and creating something new. And in fact, she knew all those people. She didn't really know Hemingway, but she had an affair with Stravinsky. She was very close to Jean Cocteau. She uh, worked with Picasso. She designed the costumes for a Cocteau production of Antigone, Picasso did the sets. She would have liked to have had an affair with Picasso, but she was exactly the kind of strong, independent woman that he avoided by the plague. So that was my original um, interest was aesthetic. And then I started to see her as one of these people whose life transcended the details of her own experience to symbolize something more. And that to me made, really made her Attractive. Yeah. So she's an amazing. You're right. She's an amazing character. So, Christine, I'm thinking about you know your book, and I'm thinking about books that have made me laugh. Um, so, do you have any favorite humorous writers? Well, you know, you mentioned Joshua Ferris's book, and I know you're friends with him and his wife. She's also a writer. I have her book. Um, I take yeah, you, yeah, Eliza Kennedy. She's a wonderful writer. Yeah, and. Um, I loved Then We Came to the End. And I and I also uh, really liked um, Dear Committee Members, Julie Schumacher's yes, hilarious. novel about academia. And I haven't read it yet, but Andy Borowitz's new book, I think it's like Profiles in Ignorance about, <laughs> he is very funny. He wrote this one piece that, I don't know where it originally appeared, but it was in Poets and Writers when I saw it. And it was first lines of novels and they were all just unbelievably hilarious. And if you can do that, like one line and make someone laugh, I just thought that's, you know, that, that's such a skill. Like it's really, he's so funny. And um, I, I'm trying to think of other, well, I like David Sedaris. I like George Saunders, you know, they're very. My, yeah. my personal favorites are Bruce J. Friedman, Charles Portis. Yes. Charles Portis makes me die laughing. I have to read The Dog of the South. Dog of the South is fantastic. I've heard it's Gringos hilarious. Gringos is fantastic. Gringos? Okay. And then my friend Elizabeth McKenzie has a book coming out. She wrote The Portable Veblen. I really love that. Her She's new book is, good. yeah, her new book is The Dog of the North. So it's coming dog, out no, I, in I, April. Is, is she a Portisian? I think she is. I think she might be very mindfully yeah. you took her title from Port. I've changed her title as a homage to Portis. So those are some of the writers who are really and Jim Harrison, who of course died a number of years ago, but some of like his brown dog novellas are very funny. Unbelievably funny. He's so good. He's, he was so good. I love his work. 
So we only have, I, I, my, my, my plan has already been <laughs> nullified by reality. It's like so many of our plans, um, <laughs> but we only have a couple more minutes. So I'm, I'm curious for both of you, what, what is it like right now publishing a novel. I mean, I haven't published a novel in a couple of years, and things change very, very quickly. Is 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 this is is it does it feel alive out there? What 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 is it, what is it like for you, Joy? What is it like now, bringing a, a book out and trying to, you know, cut through the cultural din and and and, and be heard? <laughs> well. Um... I, I really, I'm not very active on social media and um, I don't really like social media. So uh, it's been hard for me to feel that I, sh that I should do it, but I know that I should do it. It seems like that's more important than ever now. Um, I just want people to like my book and read it without my having to. <laughs> be on Instagram all the time or whatever. Um, I don't know, I think it's a very crowded, well, for historical fiction, it's a really crowded field and it's very hard to, to get any, any traction or any, any attention because there, there are so many. Well, there's no review space anymore. I mean, yeah. I noticed that, that, that the Daily Times basically has no more book reviews. Yeah. Maybe have one or two a week now. Yeah. It's, it's hard, um, but I, I'm, I'm in the middle right now of going on a tour with the Jewish Book Council. And nice. that's been really great. Um, they, uh, those audiences are fantastic. And uh, so I'm engaging on that, on that level with that, that group, of, group of people and they, they've arranged it all. So, um, but, but yeah, I think it's, 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 it's really, really, really tough out there. I think Christine probably will agree with you. Do you feel that way too, Christine? I do. I mean, I have had a few reviews so far. I did put out that anthology, Love in the Time of Time's Up, and it came out October 4th, which has short fiction by writers like Lynn Freed and Gina Frangello and Karen Bender. And we got no reviews other than Booklist. And it, you know, I mean, you just, as you said, there's not a lot of review space. I am on social media. I find it sort of a devil's bargain. I don't really want to be vlogging my books, but whether you're with a big press or a small press, the expectation is that you will. And also I do want people to read my work. So I, you know, I do post stuff. I try to do it as least obtrusively as possible. If that is, <laughs> I don't even know if it's possible to be unobtrusive when you're promoting your work. So I, and you know, I, I have, I am with small presses. I was with Bloomsbury, but you know, despite getting good reviews, I didn't sell lots and lots and lots of copies. So they, you know, even though my editor wanted to publish more of my work, she couldn't get approval to do it. So I, you know, I flailed around writing one book after another for, for eight years before I managed to publish this book and then the anthology. And then I have a story collection coming out in June from Northwestern University Press, but it's, I actually, like, just to be honest, I've lost money publishing these books because I've done a lot of promoting and traveling and I hired a publicist, my friend Cheryl Johnston, who's terrific. But, you know, unless you can get bookstores to carry the book and then sell a lot of copies, it's very difficult. So I, but nonetheless, I really love this book. I had such a great time writing it. I love the anthology too. So I'm just hoping somehow word of mouth you know, but I also, sorry to interrupt myself, but <laughs> I see we do have one question from um, a viewer, Carol Ahern, for Joya, I think, in fact. Yes, but I feel we've, we've covered that question accidentally. Oh, okay. Oh, she's asking, she's asking if Winston Churchill helped right. Chanel leave France, and I think what she's referring to is when Chanel was released from FFI custody. If, if I think Churchill intervened, which is a lot of what people think happened. Why was Chanel released when Arletti, who was a famous actress of the day, if anybody who's zooming in remembers her, um, 
or knows of her. She was put in prison. She had also lived with a, with a German officer during the war. She was very, very famous, as famous as Chanel. And she got thrown in jail. Why didn't Chanel? And some people think it was because Churchill intervened because um, she knew Churchill. And, but it's like August, 1944. Churchill's got more important things to worry about than Chanel. So I don't think it was, it was Churchill. And other people think it was her friend, Pierre Reverdy, who was a poet and a member of the resistance and also a sometime lover of hers. He might've had some connection to the people who arrested her. But I don't think, I, I don't know. And nobody knows and Chanel doesn't really know either, I don't think. And it's also possible that they just released her because they realized that they couldn't hold her for anything. They had no proof of what she did, so. I don't know. No one really knows. I well, wonder if it was a commercial um, importance too, if that was part of it. But I, I mean, who knows what the calculus was? Yeah, you mean that that that, that Chanel would be valuable to the future of uh, yeah. Economic yeah. yeah 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 good point. Well, we are we're clean out of time, and I want to thank you both. It's been great to hang out with you, even for this short time and in this. Zoom environment. I do want to say that you've both written wonderful books and we've all been in this position that, that publishers basically expect us to be our own little mini publishing company and put the book out there and find readers and find reviewers and find venues. And it's, um, it's really not quite I don't. I don't think that the publishers are are are, are doing their jobs. I, I've had books that have done very little here and get published someplace abroad and do five times as well without. I have no social media there. I have no events there. I have no, you know no writing little essays for. Lit Hub or the Wall Street Journal, you know, for free and you know, as a way of uh, publicizing the book. None of that stuff happens yet. Uh, the, the the book does well because there's a publisher out there who believes in it and and makes sure that uh, that that some attention gets paid. And, and and in too many cases, that that's not that's not happening. I mean, they'll. they'll take a, a small economic risk and then leave it to you to make sure that the, the book is successful. And if it's not, it's not their fault, it's your fault. So, but I don't want to end on a negative note because you both, <laughs> you, you both have written, you know, beautiful books and they're, they're you know, Christine's is hilarious and Joya is completely engrossing and gripping and, and, and illuminating and I, I uh, I, I hope you both sell a shit ton of copies. So do we. Helen, thank you. <laughs> Enjoy it too. I'm just so happy that we could do this. It's such a highlight for me and, and having this book come out and just being able to see all of you and be here. Well, we're thrilled to have had the opportunity to host you. And thank you, Scott, for bringing Christine's book to our attention at Oblong Books. We appreciate that. It's a great book. Trust me on this, and the holidays are coming up. Anybody who works in an office, <laughs> oh, I'm going to chill for you now. But I mean, I'm serious. It is. It is laugh out loud, loud, funny, and people will you'll really enjoy it. So there's a link in the chat. Um, the book is available at oblongbooks.com or in either of our stores in Rhinebeck or Milliton and Joya. What can we say? It's Coco Chanel. It's a fascinating story. It's an amazing novel. Another great gift idea for the holidays. We have copies in both stores and at oblongbooks.com. And we have pretty much all of Scott's books, I think, in stock. And probably most of them are signed. Uh, Scott has his own page on our website. And I posted the link in the chat. But if you just go into our search bar and put Scott Spencer, all of his titles pop up. Again, you can't go wrong. Um, if, you, if you have a, a reader that, that just loves novels and fine fiction, um, I would highly recommend any of Scott's books. Thank you all for joining us this evening. It's been a pleasure. Thank it you really so has. Much. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.